thank you for tuning in with me and those of you who are coming in for the first time god bless you and those of you who was already um subscribed god bless you and and thank you for coming back and tuning in with me again so today i um i want to share my testimony with you i i've been working on this for a while and um it takes uh it took a lot for me um to go back in time pretty much and um remember the events of my life and 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 document them again and and to be here to speak about them um but thank god you know because of the holy spirit um he reminds us the things that he 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 wants us to share the testimony that he wants us to share so i am grateful for that um so i i pray that um this testimony will bless someone and and heal help someone heal and and resonate with someone um i i really pray that this bless someone out there and know that you are not alone and god bless you um so those of you who don't know me my name is haja and i'm from west africa guinea guinea is a, a small country in the western part of africa right by senegal um i um i am half fulani and half mandingo my mother is fulani and my dad is mandingo um those two tribes are usually really against each other and there's usually some sort of a civil war between them but my mom and dad managed to get married um both of the families like my mother's family and my dad's family wasn't too okay with it because you know my dad being mandingo and my mom being fulani um but they got married um and then they had me and my little brother Um so I remember my my dad growing up he he was a very very he was a very very strict strict muslim man he was a madras he was a madras very strict about you know about islam and um about everything that has to do with islam he wanted to live he literally wanted to live by the book um and he did pretty much he did pretty much um so he married my mother and um i remember at uh at age 3 um my dad used to um abuse my mom abuse her quite often um really beat her and you know till this day i remember the screams and the cries um and uh, he would turn off the lights and um uh, I remember you know he would go and open the fridge and get cold water and come pour it on my mother and and beat her up and hit her and keep pouring the cold water on her and hit her and I am standing there as a 3 year old and uh, all I do all I could do is just cry 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 because I I I I couldn't do anything and for my dad he wanted my mom to even submit while he's he, she's being abused so this continued and continued and continued so one fateful night um he he started they got into some sort of argument and uh, my dad started to beat her again and this time he would throw the chairs and things in the house and uh it got very chaotic i remember and now uh, again you know every time they stuff you know he starts to beat my mother he would go to the fridge and reach for cold water and uh cup of water my mother my mother and keep hitting her keep beating her up and uh and that night i remember it was raining and there was thunder outside um my dad uh opened the door and put me outside pushed me out 
But by the time that he pushed me out and closing the door, my finger was there and then he closed the door on my finger and my finger got cut on the door and I still have the mark today. So that was the night that everything ended. And he finally, uh, he kicked us out. He finally kicked us out and uh, before he kicked us out, my mother had learned that he got remarried, he got married, he took a second wife. And and that fateful night and it was raining, my uncle came in the truck and put all of my mom's stuff inside and uh, we went to Sare, which is a, another little city uh, sector, you can call it. Uh, so we went there and my mom needed to make ends meet. She needed to work to take care of us. Um, she couldn't work with me and my little brother. My I was three years old, going on four, and my brother was three months, three months, just three months. And um, but she had nowhere to take us because my mother lost her father and her mother when she was also young, but she had her aunt, which we, we I knew as my grandmother. So she was in Pita, so my mom decided to take us to Pita. So when my mom took us to Pita, we arrived there, my grandmother, lovely woman, lovely woman, showed me so much love and uh, beautiful. Everybody loved her. Um, so we lived with her and uh, I started going to school, but for some reason, I was really good at hiding my pain. I I had a relationship with my dad. I, I missed my dad, but I also didn't want my mom to be abused. So I kind of had to choose which feeling that I had, I, I had to hold on to at age three. So we started going to school and um, I was very vibrant, very smart, um, loved to play in teams and just, I, I don't know how I did as a child to, 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 to block that part of me and that, 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 that sad part of me and, and 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 just try to be happy. And, um, but deep down, something was missing. I, that, I missed my dad because although he was who he was, but he would take me out dancing. He would dance with me. He would take me to the movies. He would, uh, you know, he would tell me that I was his favorite and I was his first daughter. And I'm a photocopy of my father. So everybody knew as soon as they see me, they knew that I was his daughter. Um, so I miss that. I miss, I miss that. But again, I had to make a choice. But um, but in the same city that where we were living in, my uh, my paternal grandparent lived there too. Um, so I'd go there to visit. I'd go there to visit them. But it was only my my uh my father's sisters and 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 stepmothers and stepsisters that was there because my dad also lost his mom and dad early 
so it was hard but my stepmother uh his step my my father's stepmother was was nice so i'll go there and uh, that was the closest i could feel from being close to my dad if that makes any sense i was looking for some way to still connect with my dad um, so i would go over there and uh, so when i started going there and this i was three going on four years old my uncle um would molest me he would molest me and i remember it being so painful so painful I remember telling him to stop. But it kept going. He never stopped. I hated it. I hated it. Because it was so painful. But he also told me that if I told anyone, if I ever told anyone that I would never see my father again. So I kept quiet <laughs> because I wanted to see my dad. So this went on for a long time. I remember one time my dad came to visit us and um, it was night time and I was supposed to go to school in the morning so my dad and his brother the one who was molesting me was walking up walking me to my grandmother so we walked by we live by the mosque and then when we got right by the mosque, my dad was on my right side and on my left was the mosque and my, my, my uncle was carrying me, holding me like this. And then then he, he would slip his fingers and start touching me. And as a little girl, I look to my right. It's my dad. And I look to my left. It's the mosque. It's Allah's house. The one who was supposed to save me, I thought. And I felt betrayed as a child. I can never forget that day. So they took me home and I just kept quiet. As this keep going on, I thought my father and Allah both failed me.
So this went on until I was about eight years old. It didn't stop. I started being resentful. I started being sad. But you can't say anything. First of all, he threatened me not to say anything. Second of all, the culture, Islam, won't let you say anything. And then around at eight years old, my aunt, my dad's stepsister, started to molest me. I call her Yaya Hadiya to go for now. She started doing things to me. That was hideous. Till this day, the smell haunts me. That's why I'm such a neat person. I cannot stand smell or anything dirty. I said to myself at that age, a woman, how, how can it be? And she told me the same thing. She said, do not say anything, because if you ever say anything, I'll make sure you're not going to see your father. At that point, I didn't even care anymore. that age I realized that the love that I had for my earthly father was damaging my life and I started not participating in school I started redrawing from people I started not caring about anything else. I remember I used to cry to Allah. And ask him where he was. Never had an answer. So, I stopped going to my father's family house because my dad would only come to visit us once a year or every two years. So I stopped. I didn't know what to do anymore. I didn't know who to talk to about it. Especially my aunt being a woman in Islam and doing that to me was 
something that I didn't even know how to think about or bring about or talk about. So, a couple of years later, at the age 11, I'm thinking that <laughs> the pain will stop. At age 11, they took me to, to the lady, to this lady's house. And they lied to me because they said that we were going to the market. But we weren't going to the market. They took me to perform They took me to undergo female genital mutilation short for FGM They took me to go to undergo female genital mutilation. When we got to the lady's house, I was, there was some women over there. And then they laid me on the table. And then I remember them held, holding my hands, my arms. And I remember the lady injecting me with a, I don't know what. And I instantly felt like I was, I cannot explain. I felt this burn, this heat. Like my inside was burning and then I managed to like wiggle and get off the table and run but I couldn't run so they brought me back to the table and they laid me back down and she cut me and I screamed and I looked down and I was bleeding. I asked them why. They said it's part of our culture, part of the religion. We have to, we have to do it. If I want to become a woman. So they picked me up after they were done. back to my grandmother I remember looking at myself at 11 asking why am I here Why am I here? This was horrifying. It caused me so much pain. In my life so much pain in my life it caused me but 
I guess I was one of the lucky ones because some girls they actually after performing FGM on them they actually sew them together so that they cannot be with anyone but their husband and when I, I healed from that I thought, okay, maybe now it's over. <laughs> but I guess it was not over. A little bit later, Karma Kusharif, an Isma a Islamic teacher, raped me when that happened I was already done This is a person that is well respected. People go to him for all sort of things. Teachings, sacrifice, you name it. done I was completely done so after that at age 13 my uh, my mother later brought me to America to study and be with my uncle here and study so I came and uh, I went to high school <laughs> I went to high school and um, <sighs> but I had to force myself to participate on any Islamic on religious applications. I knew something was missing. So, <clears throat> I went to high school and I was working going to school, working at age 13, 14, working, braiding hair, <laughs> braiding hair, <laughs> nighttime, daytime, long hours, and then go to school to try to support my family at the same time, my mom and my brother. So it wasn't easy. I felt like Cinderella <laughs> without the prince. <laughs> but the Guinean community was so toxic. So toxic. It was... It was a hard environment to grow into, to grow up in. Literally, 
it's the type of people that would see you and hug you and as soon as you walk away they will start talking about you and i knew i was different everyone had something to say about me but i did not know why i was different At times, I would lock myself in my room and cry and ask God, why do I exist and what is my purpose? Back then, I was praying to Allah, ask all these questions that I never got answers to. <laughs> I felt like I was talking to a wall. Well, yes, I was talking to a someone who was invisible, unpresent. The pain and the sorrow that I had was so heavy. But I still kept going because I knew that I could not, I, I didn't have a room to fail. I have a family to take care of. I have a mother and a brother to take care of so I cannot fail. So, God was trying to move me out of that community, the Guinean community. So I left after so much pain and I felt like I didn't belong there. I felt like an outcast. Matter of fact, I was the black sheep. Everyone had something to say about Haja. <laughs> the Guinean community was the type of people that was in there were people that would act, act like they were holy. Oh, I'm Muslim. I'm holy. But then behind closed doors, They, their sins, the stuff that they do, you cannot even talk about. It was so fake. I could not, I, I couldn't take it. I wanted something different. I wanted something different, so I left the Guinean community. But even when I left, I had to struggle to start over because I didn't know anybody. So, when I left, I tried to talk to my mother. I told her about what happened to me back in Africa. She told me to let it go, forget about it. Don't talk about it. You don't want people to hear that. And 
I tried telling my dad about what happened also. He told me to forget it. It happens to many girls. And I was hoping that my dad was going to be my superhero. But he didn't come to my rescue. They were more worried about the cover covering up in Islam the community you cannot talk about those things it's gonna bring the family name down I'm like wow I expected my mom to say that but I didn't expect my dad to say that the reason why I said that is because growing up in Africa my mom used to beat me up blue black even when I was going through all of those things in Pita she heard that I wasn't studying anymore doing good at school I used to be first then I went to 26 I remember one night she came to my grandmother and as soon as I opened the door to get into the house she slapped me to the ground and sat on my neck and started choking me that's how she always beats me up by sitting on my neck my chest area here and hold my neck so I thought my mom didn't like me because I was a photocopy of my dad and she hated my dad I thought she didn't like me so when I came to America here and when I told her that I kind of expected that from her but my dad I didn't expect that from him because it was his brother and his sister half brother and half sister I thought he was gonna fight for me but he did so at that time I no longer I, I, I no longer wanted to live anymore. So I try to I try to commit suicide. But it didn't work. I didn't die. Twice I didn't die. I was like, why I'm not dying? had his plans for me so after that I was praying I was praying to Allah
I was praying to Allah, but he didn't show up. I went to sleep. And Jesus showed up. him I was walking in this house it wasn't a house it was more like a mansion but everything was so pure and marble white as I walked up to the stairs on my right side There was a picture and it was Jesus and you saw that picture I knew it's an all knowing and then on my left side there was a stairwell going up but there was light, this bright light shining through. You could not see farther. You could not see farther down. The more the light shines, get closer, the brighter and whiter the whole place gets. And I was standing there and I was staring at the picture and I felt something that I've never felt before and that's when I woke up And I woke up from that dream and uh, I told my mother, I said, I had a dream about Jesus. She said to me, it's okay, he's just a prophet. So I didn't think much of it, I, I let it go. And then my spirit, there's something in my spirit was kind of like nagging me. But then one day I was with one of my friends at a restaurant eating. And she asked me, she's like, Haja, um, you, sh you should come to church with me. And I said to her that, no, I'm Muslim. I'm, I'm not going to go to church. I don't go to church. And then after that I sh I shared my my dream with her. And she said, I really think you should come with me to church. And I said, No, I'm not going. I'm Muslim, we don't go to church and whatever. And I was eating. I had a piece of chicken like right here eating. And it felt like someone slapped that chicken off my head. It just went flying down to the floor. And I was like, what is happening? She thought it was funny, but I was, I was petrified. I was like, this is like really, really, really crazy because there's no way this could happen. It seems like literally someone slapped that chicken out of my hand and it, like it just went over there. And we just laughed about it. And then I said to her, you know what? I'll come to church with you, you know? so she can just get off my back so then we went to church together and um, I was sitting there and I was listening to the choir singing and I was like I was looking at their faces I'm like how can 
someone love God so much. Like I can see the love, I can see the love of Christ and their on their faces. I can hear in their voices. It was just so beautiful. And then after that, the, the preacher started preaching. And then when he was preaching, I felt like he was speaking to me. I was like, why is this man talking, talking, talking about me? And I, I didn't say anything, and I just kept sitting there. And then at the end of the end of the service, he asked me. He's like, um, "Do you want to give your life to Christ?" I was like, uh, "No, I gotta think about it." <laughs> and he's like, "Okay, no problem." Um, let me pray for you. So he prayed for me. I let him pray for me, and uh, we went. I went back home. So that night, when I went back home, I I kept thinking about the songs that those girls were singing. How beautiful it was, and. And the way I felt, the peace and the the calmness, and the, it was just different. And um, I said, "This is <laughs> this is." I got very very confused, and and I was scared. But I felt like. I felt like something was happening in my spirit, but I couldn't. I I I didn't know what was happening. So I had to pray and ask God a big question. So I got on my knees and I started praying. I said to God, God, I knew. I know. This one religion all my life, but if Jesus Christ is your Son and He is God, please prove it to me because I need to know. Not even five minutes after I prayed that prayer, I was sitting down on my bed. And I went, I went into a, I had a vision and like I went into a, a trance. I had a, I had a vision because I wasn't sleeping. And again, Jesus appeared to me. This time, the first time, he wasn't facing me, and then a second later, he faced me. When he faced me, I knew. I know it was that all knowing. And then I came out of my vision. And then I got on my knees. I thanked him. I thanked him. I felt my heart. I felt like my heart was moving. I felt like my organs was being rearranged or something. I can't explain it. I felt peace. 
peace that I have never felt in my life. God healed me that night. I slept like a baby, which I didn't sleep well for a long time because I had panic attacks and nightmares, you name it. I went to sleep. I slept like a baby. And then God gave me another dream. This time I saw the pastor and he was preaching and I saw his clothes and his shoes and and then I was the next day I woke up I was excited to go to church on the Wednesday So I went to church. <laughs> when I got into, I, when I got to church, the pastor was wearing the same things that I saw in my dreams. Same shoes, same shirt, same everything. I was like, okay, this is getting very interesting. <laughs> so. And then uh, I sat there during service and, you know, it was beautiful again. And then at the end of the service, the pastor asked me, he said, would you want, you want to give your life to Christ? I said, yes. <laughs> and then he prayed for me and, um, I gave my life to Christ and he asked me if I knew how to pray in tongues. I said, I don't even know what tongues is. After he prayed for me, I started praying in tongues. And then a couple seconds later, I like lost control. I felt the fire of the Holy Spirit. I felt the presence of God. I felt the love of God, the love that I was seeking all my life. All of a sudden, it was in me. I felt his love, I felt his presence. And while the pastor was, he was praying for me. But I was not, I was not hearing the voice of the preacher. I was hearing the voice of God. It's like the way that I can describe it is like a it's like like a tunnel inside a tunnel but there's a waterfall inside a tunnel and then you have this distinct voice like a voice that's I've never heard any voice that's close to the voice and I heard and he said I am with you <laughs> I am with you
need you. At that moment, I felt that he was with me. He's been with me. But I was worshiping idols. And then after that service, I went home. My dreams, then God gave me gift, the gift of dreams. So my dreams intensified. So after receiving Christ, I am. Um, after receiving Christ, I was still hiding from my family because I didn't know how to tell them. I did not know how to tell them. I was so afraid of losing everything. Losing everything, losing my family. I was afraid of being killed for changing my religion. I was afraid of being an outcast. So I kept hiding. I didn't I didn't I didn't say anything. So th that time I had one step, one foot in Islam and one foot in Christianity. That wasn't okay. So I started going through my trials, but God always showed me in my dreams that he was there. This one night I had um, court in the morning. I was going, I was supposed to go to court and God gave me a dream. I had a visitation, an angel visitation in my dream. But this time, I saw myself as a little girl in the dream. I was sitting down with my head down, weeping, sad. And this tall being <laughs> with a white, long white robe, really big, <laughs> with a long white robe, came and tapped my shoulder. And I got up. And I looked at him and he asked me to open my hands like this. And I opened my hand and then he put his hands on top of my hands. And he asked me to close my eyes. I closed my eyes. And then when I opened my eyes, he he left but when I opened my eyes there was a feather in my hands and it vibrated like he's kind of like electric and when I woke up from that dream <laughs> I knew that God was with me with me and then that next day when I was going to court <laughs> I got out of the car right on my two right on the floor of my feet on the ground there was a white feather <laughs> and I just looked up and smiled So, so God 
kept kept giving me more dreams and angel visitations. Then I had no one but God, so I would talk to him about everything. I talked to him about everything. I kid you not. This one day, I came back from work. I was super tired. I lay down on my bed. And um, and I had to go to church. But I wanted to sleep for like a couple minutes before I go. And when I, lay, when I was sleeping, I was almost late for church. And I just felt this like rod, you know, like boom on my back. And it was not painful. You just hear it's a rod and it wakes you up. And I, and I jump off the bed, I'm like, what is this? I look around, I'm like, I know I'm the only person here. But <laughs> again, I knew inside. So I got up and went to church. So I kept hiding for a long time before I told my parents. So this one faithful day, I, you know, I've uh, met my husband and we've got married and uh, so we were in Miami at this point and um, God gave me, you know, a dream that it was time for me to tell my family. <laughs> I woke up from that dream and with the urgency that I had to, I had to do it. So I picked up the phone and um, and called my mom. When I called my mom, she um, I said to her, I said, Mom, I have something to tell you. And then she's like, okay, I'm listening. She thought it was the usual thing. <laughs> you know, just, hi, how are you? But um, I told her that I'm no more Muslim, that I left Islam, that I believe in Christ, and I'm not gonna keep living a double life. I will not forsake my God for anything or anybody. And then all of a sudden, I heard this noise. You know, like, <sighs> my mom, you know, fainted, and then my brother came and took the phone but my mom didn't really faint because she usually played that with us whenever she doesn't get her ways she tried to make herself like she passed out and she did that to me multiple times before so I couldn't tell <laughs> you know uh, she always did that to get her way, you know, she, so she did it to me and, you know, my uncle. So I just thought it's the usual. I, I probably would never find out if it's for real. But then my brother picked up the phone and, you know, cursing at me. Why did you tell my mom? Why did you tell my mom this, you know, cursing? And then why did you tell my mom this, you know? You, you've killed my mom, you killed my mom, you know, and it cursed me out and, and I like, and then I told my brother, I said, I'm not going to lie anymore. You know, I am a Christian and I love Jesus Christ and there's nothing you can do about it. I would never go back. And then he hung up the phone and uh, he went ahead and texted my husband, my poor husband. And he said to my husband, you've killed my mother and 
you've killed my mother. I was like, oh my goodness. Like, you know, they blamed my husband because they thought my husband brought me to Christianity because he's a Christian. But I was a Christian before I met my husband, you know. So, um, and then I hung up with them and then I, um, they said they didn't want it to do, they didn't want anything to do with me. So I hung up and then I, uh, so I went ahead and, um, called my uncle and also told him that I am a Christian and I believe in Christ and, um, I would not forsake him for nothing or no one and I'm never going back to Islam and I told him that I was sorry that it took so long for me to tell him but I'm not sorry that I am in love with Christ that I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior and then he said to me that what would people say? The same thing my mother said. The first thing that, that came out of their mouth is, what would people say? I am like, is that all you care about? What would people say? And then he said to me, and then, well, we're no more family, and then that's it. You can live on your own and we're gonna take your son and we're gonna give him back to his Muslim dad because you're Christian now and you cannot raise him. My son is, is from a Muslim marriage, a marriage with my mother's best friend's best friend brother that I was married to for five months and that this big whole marriage ended I ran away I was trying to fit in trying to do the right thing make everyone happy but myself so my son my my mom was taking care of him because i i couldn't i had to work and take care of them So he told me that I'm never gonna see my son again, that they're gonna give him back to his father. I told him that'll be over my dead body. That's not gonna happen. At this time, all fear of them just went away. So they disowned me. And then before I even get to call my dad and tell my dad, they have had already called my dad and told him. So my dad was sick at that time and he had a heart problem. So I was trying to find a way to tell him but they told him before I did. And my dad sent me a text message. <sighs> my dad sent me a text message disowning me through the text message. <laughs> In the text message. He told me that Muslim blood and Christian blood does not mix together. 
that I'm no more his daughter. And he said goodbye, my my daughter who was once my daughter. And I looked at that message. I said, well, goodbye for the second time, Papa. Tu m'avais laissé avant. Lorsque j'avais trois ans, means that you left me when I was three. You left me leaving me again. So my whole family disowned me and uh, but God gave me this strength like I cannot explain it like it was I was hurt but I was free I was free I was free that I wasn't hiding anymore I was free that I can give my fullness to God my full love to God I was free I wasn't hiding God anymore I was so terrified because God said that when you forsake him in front of other people, he's going to do the same in front of his father. So I couldn't stand it. It was eating me inside. But I felt free. I felt this freedom. I didn't even care that I've lost all my family. Like I didn't even care. At that point that I was willing, I wanted to give it all to God. Like take it all God, just take it all. I emptied my cup. Lord, fill my cup. I give myself completely to you. That's what I did. And I seeked God. I prayed. I fasted for like 40 days. I was seeking God. I was praying nonstop. I was on the night, in the night, in the day. I wanted God to know that this is who I am. This is what I wanted to be with you, to do for you. This is the relationship that I wanted to have with you. And that's what I did because I felt free. Although my family left me, but God didn't leave me. He filled me up. He filled me with so much love, with so much joy, and with so much strength to fight. I trusted God. I tried fighting for my son, but at the end of the day, I gave it all to God. I rolled it over to him. I trusted him. I knew he was going to do something. I prayed for my family till today. I keep praying for them. I'll never stop praying for them because I love them. So then a couple of months later, actually a year later, my dad, my dad died. A year later, my papa was dead. I never got to say goodbye. Never talked to him. But when they called me and they told me
when they called me and they told me that my papa was my papa was dead. But I was not weeping because he was dead and I didn't see him. I was weeping because he's dead and I know how much he hated Christ and how much, how much he hated Christians, called them infidels. called me infidel. I was weeping for his soul. Every time I close my close my eyes, it's like I get this vision of his soul. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed to God that God would save him. Because I love my papa. I wanted him to be saved. After that, I kept praying months, months. Thank God. He did what he does best. He restored my relationship with my son. I called. And I talked to him. And he took the phone and he said to me, Mama, I know. One day we'll talk. I know. I know everything that you've done for us. I know. Don't worry. I love you. We will talk one day. <laughs> and I just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Is great God is awesome so my journey I am still growing in you know I'm following Christ and I have more dreams and I experience his presence And it's beautiful. He healed me. He restored me. He healed me from anxiety. He healed me from depression. He healed me from brokenness. He healed me from pain. He saved my soul. He healed me from nightmares. He healed my body from the pain. 
He healed me. He healed my body. He healed the pain that FGM caused my body. He healed the trauma. He gave me peace and joy that no therapist could help, could have done for me. He continued to give me dreams and appear in my dreams. And I can't wait to start painting my dreams. That's the project that I'm working on. He healed my feet in a dream. I was laying down with my husband. My husband was asleep. And all of a sudden, between the living room and our bedroom, the sky, the, the roof opened. And then I just saw this light shining through. And then Jesus came down. And then the light was so bright. So bright. It took over the whole room. The glory, His glory. I couldn't move my feet. I was laying down on that bed and then as he gets closer the holes where they nailed him I saw it and there was light coming through and the light radiating and he looked at me and all I could say is Lord, I love you. <laughs> Lord, I love you. And you know what he did? He smiled. He smiled. And that was enough for me. And then he came near my feet. I was trying to get up in my dreams, in my dream. I got my upper body up, but I couldn't move my feet. So he came and then he touched my feet just sort of just brush against my feet and then I woke up since that day God healed my feet because my feet I used to have I it used to take me a long time to fall asleep my feet will get extremely hot and restless but he healed me from that. <laughs> God, I am telling you, Jesus Christ is awesome. <laughs> like, he is awesome. He is the truth. He is the light. He is the way. He heals the, he heals the sick. He frees us. He freed me. And I love him. I love him so much. And I do not mind sharing this part of my life for his glory. Everything is for his glory.
on future videos I'll share more of my dreams as God is just molding me I thank you guys for watching and I pray this testimony blesses someone God bless you Shalom He's the same God who was there for you in the midnight hour He's the same God who is able to wipe your tears away is the same God who was there in times of luck and want is the same God He's Jehovah my great provider tell me why you've given up on God tell me why you've given up on Him tell me why Giving up on God Hold on, change is on the way If it's enough You could not so I can even so boogie In my idea to make it One and more Jesus, yeah, you care Each I give don't you cry, change is here Weeping me in your fire at night Joy is gonna come in the morning You don't have to cry no more Hold God by His word He's gonna do what He says Lift your hands and give Him praise Hey, hey busy now you could not so I didn't even so Buki In my now dear Digite One and more Jesus You care Each I have here You can't do it I see I can't do it I know you've been crying I understand I know you've been wounded But it's okay I know you've been broken, but I'm here to mend your broken heart.